I think many people are supposed to be more joined. I don't remember, but they might think... be arriving from the yeah. Usually people are a little bit late. Yes, yeah, so they can be a bit late. But uh, let's see. Uh, I will read the seminar presentation and then I will pass the word to you, and we can uh, maybe everyone in the room can present themselves and we can see how the we can discuss how the seminar will go the next sessions and presentations and so on and readings <laughs> so the presenting the syllabus description and um, this seminar uh, this is the first session sorry there is a message saying that uh, i think that many people did not have a link what's going was in the chat. The link for panelists. And did are you resend them this and we are going to start recording them? I guess I've sent to everyone. I'm sorry if there was any mistake. This is Uh, yes, I, I will present a uh, reading from the seminar and I will just check to do it uh, these invitations. If there was any, anyone missing, uh, I will check this now. But I'm pretty sure that everything was said all right. But thank you for noticing. Uh, well, this is the first session of Bayesian Reasoning, uh, A New Science of Knowledge. Uh, with the instructor Anna Longo uh, from the program of philosophy from the new center of research and practice. It will be eight sessions at this time every week. And well, uh, the present Bayesian statistical inference and theory of decision are widely employed today in many different domains of inquiry, such as physics social sciences, economics, medicine, law, cognitive sciences, and artificial intelligence. Even though Thomas Bayes wrote the theorem of for conditioning the prob probability of hypothesis during the 18th century, it has been difficult to use it in scientific induction until the introduction of algorithm techniques that hindered the calculation practically accessible and suitable for make any sort of prediction based on big data exploration. Bayesianism is much more than a theory of probability. It is a paradigm for reasoning and learning that allows to explain how knowledge evolves, how beliefs converge towards the most reliable hypothesis, and how conventional rules for co coordinating practices can emerge to support collective interests. Moreover, Bayesian decision theory provides the model of rational agent in economics and for programming artificial intelligence. However, despite the remarkable achievement of, and the promises, Bayesianism has been criticized for being a normative and idealizing perspective of rationality that do not take into account real computational limits and the logical impossibility of achieving inductive certainty. Okay. I guess I will pass the word to Swami. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, welcome to everybody. Um, so I think that I'm going to start with uh, general introduction to the topic of Bayesian reasoning. So just that to introduce uh, this probability theory, it's a theory of probability, Bayesianism, uh, and I will try to uh, contextualize uh, the theory within the debate around induction, uh, which took place 
in the 20th century. Um, and of course, we will have more details in the next classes, really discussing uh, different aspects in a deeper way. Uh, and uh, for today, in, in the second part, uh, I think I would like you to introduce yourself uh, because I think that you are coming from different backgrounds and you have different interests that maybe uh, some of you knows very well some applications of uh, Bayesian statistical inference in specific fields. Uh, so it would be nice to know this. And in this way, we will be able also to make uh, a program for the presentation that you are supposed to make during the, the seminar. Uh, and I will provide you with like more technical uh, information. Uh, so we have two hour and a half. So I think I will introduce for one hour, one hour and a half, and we will have a little discussion, questions, whatever, and then of course, a little introduction of yourself. Okay, so let's start. So as you know, um, Bayesian um, statistical inference is um, used in any kind of field today. So um, there are application in any disciplinary field from medicine to um physics but also in trials it's used in artificial intelligence um for example the um, uh, google self-driving cars are using uh bayesian software um but also the mechanism to um sort uh, emails good emails from spams is based on uh bayesian algorithms and um, so it's it's everywhere. Um, there is also the hypothesis that the brain uh, is functioning according to uh, Bayesian statistics. So we will see also this more in details during the seminar. Um, but basically, um, this theory or best theorem is very old. So it was discovered in the 18th century and there is a long story. So the success uh, of today, um, it's a late success of so it. It took a long time uh, to understand um, how to use this theory. Also because um, the calculation is really difficult. So the, the formula is really easy. Uh, but the calculation is really difficult. Uh, so it was almost impossible to apply uh, Bayesian reasoning and calculation uh, before uh, the introduction of um, algorithmic uh, technology. Um, so in this, in this class, um, I'm not going to discuss so much uh, new contemporary applications, but I'm really trying uh, to uh, explain the basics of the history of this formula, this theory of probability, um, in order to understand this from a philosophical point of view. Uh, so I'm interested in um, the theory of knowledge, which is implied by uh, Bayesian uh, reasoning. And um, so I'm interested in the epistemological point of view. Um, so what is knowledge once uh, it's conceived according to um, Bayesian statistical induction? And I think that this is, uh, this is really important because it, it clarifies many aspects of um, today way of thinking, but also way of uh, living and of, of being. Um, so I am start with some um, example just to understand uh, what is this uh, theory. So um, I think that it's interesting to see one example from the first time it was really used. 
um, so Bess wrote this formula in the 70th, in the 18th century, but it was almost unknown. So nobody care, cared about it because it was not, not useful at, at the time. Um, so uh, it was rediscovered uh, later uh, by um, Laplace, Jean-Pierre Laplace, um, qui, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, um, qui était un, un mathema French mathematician. And one of the first uh, time he used it, it was uh, to answer to Blaise Pascal um, to critique uh, this uh, Blaise Pascal uh, bet on God, you know, the famous uh, bet, Pascal's bet. Um, so this is really interesting to understand what is this Bayesian reasoning. So uh, Pascal uh, was one of the first philosophers who was interested in probability theory. Uh, before probability, uh, theory was just about uh, games of chance. So uh, people knew about probability and they were able to calculate more or less uh, probabilities, but it was only in the field of games of chance. So the first Tractatus that we have is a medieval one uh, by Gerolamo Cardano. And uh, it's really a, a manual to play dice, to play games of chance. And basically probability is coming from games of chance and it's still a theory uh, implying the reasoning of gamblers. Um, and we will see that also uh, contemporary Bayesian reasoning is basically uh, a way of thinking which is suitable for gambling in some way, for betting. That's why it's really important in, in economics, for example. Um, there is this pragmatical aspect. Uh, so to go back to uh, Pascal, so Pascal was not Bayesian. So Pascal was really trying for the first time to apply probability to think something else than games of chance. But in some way, he brought the reasoning about games of chance in um, moral reasoning. So the uh, Pascal's uh, bet is, the, is this one. So, uh, the idea is, um, the, the question is, uh, does it worth to sacrifice uh, today pleasures um, to get eternal life in the future? Um, so, you know, that if you behave badly, uh, you, won't, you won't go to heaven. Uh, but if you behave like a good Christian, uh, you can go to heaven. So the idea for Pascal was, um, does it make sense? Uh, do I have to sacrifice my present goods for uh, future eternal life? Um, so the, the problem is that we don't know if God exists. So if God exists, yes, it's worth to sacrifice uh, today pleasures for eternal life. But if God does not exist, I sacrifice my pleasures for nothing. Um, the problem is that we don't know if God exists or not. So Pascal said, okay, since we don't know, I consider that is 50% of probability for the existence and 50% of probability for the non-existence. Um, so the two cases are equally probable uh, for Pascal. And, and this is really uh, the kind of reasoning that we make while playing, uh, for example, um, wh while we toss a coin. We have 50% of probability uh, of add and 50% of probability of uh, tail. So Pascal said, okay, the probability of existence of God is 50 and 50. Uh, that means that um, it worth to sacrifice today pleasures in order uh, to hope, to have the legitimate hope uh, of eternal life. 
Um, so the reasoning is correct in the sense that um, um, if uh, God exists and I sacrifice my pleasures, I have the most preferred good. So we have we, we need this is the order of preferences. We will see that the order of preferences is really, really important. So we have to order our preferences. So the most preferred good is eternal life. Uh, a little bit less preferred good is um, the sacrifice of our pleasure because the worst possible scenario is eternal damnation. So what we have to avoid absolutely is eternal dam damnation and eternal life is preferred to uh, the sacrifice of um, present uh, pleasures. Um, so if I have to bet, I have to make a bet, which give me the hope to get the most preferred uh, scenario, to, to find myself in, in, the best, in the best scenario, and to avoid at the same time the worst possible scenario. So, what is rational here is uh, to sacrifice present pleasure, like uh, I put uh, the pleasant, present pleasures in on the table to legitimate hope for eternal life. Um, so it seems to work. So if we are not Bayesian, it works. Uh, but if you are Bayesians, it does not work. Um, and so this is the answer uh, that um, Laplace um, provided to uh, this, this argument. So uh, Laplace was Bayesian. So Laplace knew uh, the theorem. And so he said, this reasoning is not correct. It's completely rational. Why is completely rational? It's completely rational because we are assuming equal probability for the existence of God. So we are assuming that the hypothesis that God exists and the hypothesis that God does not exist has a 50% uh, chances. Um, but this is not correct from a Bayesian point of view. Um, we have to calculate the probability of a hypothesis. So we have to calculate the probability that, we exist, that God exists. Uh, rather than saying, okay, it's 50 50. Uh, how to do this? To do this, we have to um, verify the evidences. So, the, the empirical support, the information which is supporting the hypothesis of existence of God and the hypothesis of the non existence. Uh, so, according to uh, Laplace, uh, the evidences that are supporting the belief in the existence of, of God um, are not sufficient for a, a strong belief in the existence um, because they're not reliable. So it, according to, um, to Laplace, these evidences for the existence of God are not reliable. The testimony is not reliable. Uh, it's really important uh, this, this idea of a testimony. So it's the information that we have about uh, an hypothesis, so the, the information supporting a predictive hypothesis. So what is important here is to, um, to understand that we are comparing two predictive hypotheses. So we are comparing the hypothesis of existence and the hypothesis of a non-existence. Uh, what we have to find out is the probability of the hypothesis based on the information or the evidences. Uh, so according to Laplace, since the hypothesis of existence of God is not well supported by evidences or by reliable testimonies, uh, the probability of existence of God is smaller than the probability of non-existence of God. Uh, this means that um, what I have to do in order to get my preferred uh, good um, is um, is not to behave as if there was a 50% probability of existence of God, but I have to take my decision um, considering that the probability of existence of God is very, very small. 
and the probability of non-existence of God is much bigger. So you have to, to get to, to the unity. So if you have, for example, 50 and 50, but you can have 80% and 20%. So we can say, for example, the probability of existence of God based on the evidence that I have is 10%. Probability of non-existence is 90%. This means that I cannot sacrifice my present pleasure for the really, really small probability of existence of God. So according to uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, applying Bayesian reasoning, um, Pascal is wrong. And what is ra rational is to bet on the non-existence, so uh, not sacrifice uh, my present pleasures. Um, so this is just uh, an early uh, application um, to see uh, another example. Uh, we can think of um, a game of dice. So um, it's a bet on, on a dice, a regular dice with six faces um, and really a regular dice number from one to six. Um, so um, if I had to, to bet, I know that I have one on six uh, chances of winning. So no problem, the risk is calculated, it's really easy, you know? But then imagine that um, you uh, have two offers. One is coming from a friend of you, and it's really a uh, dear friend of you and you don't know what to do. It's kind of Sunday, rainy afternoon and you, you want to kill the time. So your friend tell you, okay, just play dice. Um, and the other offer is in the street. You are just walking in the street and some people that you don't know stop you and ask you, oh, you wanna play dice with us? Um, do we accept both bets or not? Of course, uh, the tendency is to trust my friend. And the other idea is, OK, I do not trust people offering to play dice in the street, because everybody knows that um, the, the dice is not fair. So here, this is an example of Bayesian reasoning. So the hypothesis that the dice is correct, so the hypothesis that you have one on six chances to win is okay if I believe in the hypothesis that the dice is a fair one. So it's because I know my friend that I uh, believe in the hypothesis about the probability. So I, I believe that it's a fair dice, so I believe that um, I have one chance on six uh, to win. But if I don't trust the person who is offering me the dice, uh, I know that is offering me a forecast, which is one on six chances to win. But I know that the chance is less because I don't trust his forecast. So I know that the dice uh, can be um, are not, not fair. So this is a Bayesian reasoning. So I have to evaluate the probability of a predictive hypothesis. And usually I have a plurality of predictive hypotheses and um, I have to um, set uh, the degree of belief in the different hypotheses based on the background information that I have. So I have the information that my friend is reliable so I think that his forecast is reliable. Uh, I have the information that uh, there are uh, people uh, in the street just trying to steal money. And so I don't believe that the forecast that they are proposing, it's a good one. Uh, so in Bayesian reasoning, we have to evaluate the probability of a predictive hypothesis. So it's a, a sort of, second order probability. So it's the probability that a probabilistic forecast is reliable. And this is based on uh, information. 
Then, of course, what is important in Bayesian reasoning is the updating. So we will see this more in details uh, later. So I have these two ideas, for example, that my friend is reliable, the bet offered by my friend is reliable, uh, the bet offered by unknown people in the street is not reliable, but then I can observe. So I can uh, observe uh, other people play in the street and I see, for example, that um, the dice uh, looks fair and I can play with my friend and I can realize that he's really trying to steal my money. Uh, so the probability of a two hypothesis change. I consider maybe more reliable uh, the forecast which is proposed by the people in the street and less reliable uh, the uh, offer, um, my friend's offer. So when I have new information, new observation, I can modify the probability of the hypothesis. So this does not change the idea that on a dice, you have one of six probabilities. What you are changing is the probability that the hypothesis of future chances is correct. Um, so now we are going to see um, how this is important uh, to solve the problem of induction, how this is applied in, uh, for example, science, and um, why this this way of reasoning uh, is so uh, so success successful. Uh, so as you yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I was wondering if it was. I was wondering if anyone would have questions and would like to object. Feel free to do so. I guess right. And I was thinking also if it would be good for people to present so they themselves so they could maybe do objections or. Uh, yeah, or maybe we do this later. Do you have any question for now? Sure. Sorry, please, uh, just, just to share these thoughts, but please continue. So, sorry. Okay. So then, yes, of course, if you have any, any question, okay, just, this was just the real basic, basic, basic idea of what is. Um, Bayesianism, so it's a probability of hypothesis. Um, so, uh, as you know, uh, there is this problem of induction, which was the um, David Yu problem. Um, so, um, David Hume said that it's not possible to uh, rely on um, induction. So the famous idea is that um, we don't know if the sun will rise tomorrow. So even though uh, we can observe the sun rising every day, uh, we still don't have a certainty about um, the future. Uh, so there is no inductive certainty, cannot be uh, achieved. Um, so the idea is, do we have to stop um, to try to have uh, inductive uh, theory? This would mean to, um, to stop science in some way, because we should rely only of deductive reasoning. And of course, deductive reasoning is coming from a metaphysical principle, and you cannot demonstrate the metaphysical principle, so it's, it's a problem. Um, so, um, many uh, different ideas came in the 20th century to solve uh, this problem of induction. And uh, um, here, uh, for the first time, uh, probability theory was used in science um, and not only in games of chances. Um, I started to use probability theory in science when they discover um, systems which were actually probabilistic. Uh, so for example, in statistic physics for the states of gases, for example, 
that was first used in this um, circumstances, for example, Boltzmann, uh, you have probabilistic theories about the possible states of a system. So you, you know that you have your, your system and the probability of, and you have different probabilities for the different states of the system. Um, the problem was that they didn't have uh, a real mathematical theory of probability uh, because it was just a, a theory that was used for games of chance. So it was not legitimate to apply it to physics, uh, mostly because the main problem is, do we apply probability because there is real chance in nature? Or do we apply probability because we, have, we are ignorant? So is probability measuring real chance? Or is probability measuring our ignorance? So this is the big, um, the big debate, the reason for the big debate. So the axioms of probability were provided by uh, Kolmogorov, um, the formal system based on a uh, set, set theory. So the idea uh, is that you have um, a universe. A universe is the set of a possible, like a dice. Uh, so the universe for a dice is, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the universe. And uh, the probability of any occurrence is um, one on six. But of course, in, in the axiomatics, you say that any um, element of the universe uh, has um, probability one, because it can occur. And something which is not in the, in the set, like for example, eight, as probability zero. The idea is that uh, if you throw the dice an infinite number of time, you have the uh, certainty to get, for example, number two. Of course, if you throw the dice twice, uh, you cannot say that you will get the number two. So the idea is that you need an infinite number of trials and um, you have the probability of having, of getting your result in an infinite series. So for, if, if you throw a dice, uh, you can have, for example, six times the same number. Um, so this, this means that uh, in the formal system, any element of, the, of a set has probability one in an infinite numbers of trials. Um, so it's the law of the large numbers. Um, the problem is that it's really difficult to apply uh, this to uh, induction, because when we are in induction, uh, the things are the other way around, in the sense that we have a series and we don't have a universe. So when we are in an induction problem, you are, for example, observing the results of um, a dice, but you don't know what the dice is. So you have to make the hypothesis of how many faces uh, has this variable, this ale aleatory variable that I'm using, observing the results. So I am observing the results. The results can be one, six, three, four, and you have this series of results. And you have to establish from this observation the number of, uh, of values of a supposed uh, random variable. So this is a random variable, supposed to be a random variable uh, because um, the series of results um, is um, a series that does not have any order uh, in the sense that even though I see um, a certain number, I cannot predict the following. So if I throw the dice and I get three, there is no less probability to get three again at the, at the following trial. So there is no way uh, to predict the following outcome, even if I know all the series of the past trials. So even if I observe um, a dice which is thrown 100 times, I cannot predict better what will happen at the 101st 
trial. This is um, this is because it's a it's a random variable. If I could, there would be a law, but it's random because there is no law. So even though I observe um, an infinite numbers of trials, I don't know what the next one will be. I have no more reason uh, to, to forecast the next one. So when we are in induction, we have this series of repetitions, um, for example, experimental repetitions. Um, and uh, what is important from this standpoint is to say, okay, I have my series of repetitions with different results. And I have to uh, say what is this, how many values as the variable, like how many faces as the dice that I'm throwing. Um, so it's the other way around. Uh, so for example, um, von Mises was uh, one of the first uh, who tried to axiomatize this uh, viewpoint uh starting from the notion of collective so a collective is an absurd series of results um a random series of results experimental results so i repeat the same experiments over and over i get a series of results the series of results is a collective if it's a random series now the problem is to define a random series because the definition of random series is that it cannot be defined because if it could be defined, it would be random. Uh, anyway, uh, I said, if we have this collective, which is a random series of results, like the results that I get by throwing a dice or tossing a coin, um, in order to know the probability, the dis probability distribution, I have to take the frequencies of the different results and I have to calculate the limit of the frequencies. So for example, if I, uh, if I toss a coin uh, 1 million times, um, I can see that I have 50% um, probability of 1 and 50% probability of 2. Uh, this is true in a long, long series. It cannot be true uh, if I have a short one. So if I, if I throw my coin, um, if I toss my coin twice, for example, I can get the same result both the times. So I need a long series in order to understand what is the limit frequency. So probability is equal to the limit frequency. So I need to repeat the experiment um, at infinity if possible, since it's not possible. Uh, Misa said that, okay, we can suppose that any section, any um, subset of a collective is uh, a random series in itself. So the, the tendency uh, to the um, probability distribution is the same. Of course, this is really problematic. Uh, it's really problematic because first, if, you, if we don't have an infinite series is ambiguous, we will never get an infinite series of trials. Um, Moreover, how do we know that the repetitions are repetitions of the same? Um, so this was not a way of solving, in some way, the problem of, uh, of induction. Um, so, um, but this is the theory of uh, objective probabilities. So the theory of objectives, so because we have to see how Bayesian is subjective opposed to objective and logic. Uh, so according to this objective view, uh, there are real random variable in nature. So it's like nature is really throwing dice, tossing, tossing coins, spinning roulettes. The idea is, okay, there are real random variables in nature and we have to guess um to find out uh how many values possible values characterize uh, these uh, random variables and this is objective chance um but of course it, it's it's really it's really problematic 
Um, so the second um, hypothesis, sec second um, interpretation of probability is the logic interpretation of probability. So, um, of course, according to this objective interpretation, which is based on frequencies, um, the um, chance is real. So it's not, it's not, does not depend on ignorance, but it's real. So there are real, we are, we are applying probabilities because there are real random variables. So because there is, there is real chance, uh, which of course is really difficult to be demonstrated. On the other side, we have the idea that we apply probability because we don't know, it, it's, it's ignorance. Um, so the idea is that, okay, we can make the hypothesis that there is a random variable, so that uh, specific uh, phenomenon is determined by uh, a random variable, a real random variable, but of course we can say, is this hypothesis reliable or not? Which is the probability that uh, this phenomenon is determined by a random variable which can assume three values, four values, six values, et cetera. Um, so from the standpoint of logical probabilities, uh, we have to evaluate um, the probability of an hypothesis based on uh, knowledge, uh, based on logic. So we have a proposition, it's, a, it's logic probability. So probability is a measure of a logical implication between evidences and hypotheses. Uh, so we have a proposition, which is a description of a state of a world, uh, which is a proposition about evidences, uh, like uh, experimental trials. And we have a proposition, which is a prediction. We have to measure the logical implication between premises, so evidences, information, and the prediction. Uh, so for example, Carnap said that we have um, two probabilities. So he said probability one is the probability of the hypothesis and probability two is the probability which is expressed by the hypothesis. So for example, if I say I have uh, one on six chances of uh, winning my game of dice, uh, this is probability two. But this same hypothesis can be more or less probable based on the evidences that I have. So if I already know that I'm throwing a fair dice, the uh, prediction I have one chance on six is completely entailed. So if I know that I have a, a regular dice with six faces, uh, the prediction I have one on six chances to win is logically correct because it's really entailed by, but if I don't know if the dice is fair or unfair, um, the, the, the implication is partial. Um, it's a partial implication. So probability in, in this view, uh, it's a measure of the logical implication when uh, the implication is partial. Uh, it's not a conclusive argument, so it's not a tautology, uh, but there is a possible inference. The inference is almost correct. So I know that I, I have reasons to believe, even though it's not completely certain. So this is this theory of confirmation in, in Carnap's terms. Uh, so when I, I confirm a theory, I rise the degree of belief in the hypothesis, in a probabilistic hypothesis. So the more evidences I get, the more uh, I have reasons to believe in the prediction um, until I, I hopefully uh, I have a total, a full, uh, implication. Um, and the theory of logical probability, so Carnap uh, wrote this 
big book in the 50s about um, logical probabilities, um, which is uh, part of his uh, confirmation theory. Uh, so, of course, for Carnap, there is no possibility of falsification. We only have a continuous process of confirmation. So the process of confirmation basically is a process of rising the probability one, so the probabilities of probabilistic hypothesis. So the idea is um, what was objective probabilities? So the idea that there is a random variable uh, which uh, gives me um, a certain uh, probability of, uh, of observing a future event. This same probability that, for example, I naturally is playing with a dice, uh, the same probability, which is probability two, must be measured in probability one. So how much do I have to believe in the hypothesis that there is a real random variable? So it's a way of measuring my ignorance. So probability is a um, precise measure of the ignorance about the probabilistic hypothesis. And so this is really important for the problem of induction because for David Hume, uh, we just didn't know but it was not possible to measure how much we didn't know. So it was not possible to measure the degree of belief that an hypothesis deserves. Uh, so here, the, the advance is to be able to measure, in this case, from a logical standpoint, to measure the degree of belief in a predictive hypothesis. Um, another person was, um, first, be before Carnap, who introduced, uh, wrote an essay, a treatise on probabilities, uh, was Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, the economist. Uh, so John Maynard Keynes wrote this, it was his dissertation when he was a PhD student. Uh, it was a treatise on probabilities. And um, he was one of the first person to introduce this logical theory of probabilities. Um, of course, before Carnap, so it's not, it's, so the idea is the same. The basic idea is that probability is measuring the degree of implication between a proposition um, expressing the evidence and a proposition expressing a forecast. Um, and um, I can measure the degree of belief in, in the hypothesis uh, thanks to logic, thanks to this, um, the logical implication, um, we will see that um, it's important for two reasons. First reason is that uh, Ramsey, who is one of the first to really introduce in, in the contemporary world the theory of subjective probabilities. Uh, so Bayesian uh, probability theory is subjective probabilities. So one of the first person who introduced uh, the subjective point of view is Frank Ramsey. Frank Ramsey uh, was a Keynes student in Cambridge, and he basically developed this theory against Keynes. Uh, second reason, because it's important to mention that Keynes supported uh, logical probabilities, is that um, Milton Friedman uh, said that uh, John Maynard Keynes was supporting a normative idea uh, of uh, economic science because of its uh, theory of logical probability. And um, Milton Friedman, on the other side, said, OK, I am doing a positive science of economics because I'm using Bayesian probabilities. Uh, so we see that there is, um, it's important to mention that uh, Keynes was logic because we will see that in the liberal time, um, economic science is based on subjective probability and in particular on uh, Bayesian uh, reasoning. Um, so, um, the problems in uh, logic probabilities, uh, for the same for Carnap and, and Keynes, uh, maybe more for Keynes, uh, is that um, we cannot measure everything. So if uh, the probability is measuring the implication between a proposition on the evidences and a proposition um, on the expectation, 
uh, we cannot measure the probability of anything. So for example, for Keynes, uh, it was possible um, to measure um, the probabilities of events um, which were based on um, confirmed scientific theories, but it was not possible, for example, to say, okay, um, if a war will, will happen in the next month. So the, the prediction that there will be a war, for example, is not entailed by any, any evidence. So we can have reason, okay, to say probably there will be a war, but it's not possible to measure logically the implication between uh, the signs of the imminent war, the political situation which is leading to a war, and the prediction there will be a war. So this is not logically implied. Um, the same for, for Carnap. So it could work in uh, science um, if we are empiricists or if we decide that there are some given, uh, some basic observations, these are all the limits that have been criticized uh, with respect to Carnap uh, theory. But mostly the problem is that we can calculate the probability only of event for which we have uh, experimental evidences. And we cannot calculate the probability of any other things. Um, the subjective interpretation of probability uh, have, has the advantage that we can calculate the probability of anything. We can calculate the probability of um, the war the next month. Uh, we can calculate the probability, of course, which is uh, connected with scientific theories. Uh, but we can calculate really the probability of anything. So there is no problem. And we can apply the same method for calculating the probability of uh, future events uh, using the same method. So what is really important, this is why I'm wondering, is it a science of knowledge, uh, is that uh, we can apply the same method, the same calculation, to calculate the probability of anything. And uh, in a rational way, supposed to be. Uh, how uh, is that possible? And this is also the reason why it is important for induction. Uh, because it provides a unified method um, for any kind of discipline, uh, for any kind of event. Um, and it's also a way of, it's, it's a theory of the production of knowledge, so it's a theory of learning. Uh, so the problem is always, uh, also for the logical point of view, the problem is that uh, scientific theories change all the time. So even though I have uh, my, my theory uh, and I think that is correct, then it changed. So I, I have to change all my logical implications. So this is also what, uh, for example, Keynes says. So if I have a new discovery, I have to change uh, all the um, degrees of belief, um, which are based on, on logic. Uh, and this is really difficult to do in, in a logical framework. So in, in a logical framework, we can confirm a theory, but it's really difficult to say, okay, my logic was wrong. Um, so in Bayesian uh, reasoning, there is no problem because there is no logical constraint. So in logical, uh, from the logical point of view, you have, you have logical constraints, so you cannot, um, you cannot believe something which is not logically implied. So there are no reason to believe uh, in a prediction which is not uh, implied by uh, the evidence that I have, logically implied, so strictly. So in, for example, Keynes is said to be normative because belief, a logical belief, so people should believe or to believe some prediction, but not others because some prediction are logical implication or logic in, logical inferences, other prediction are not. Um, so it's about what you should believe rationally. Uh, from the point of view of uh, subjective uh, probabilities, um, there, there are no constraints. Um, 
So the, to make an example, okay, so we said that uh, we, can, we can use um, frequencies and logical interpretation only if we have um, experimental evidences. Uh, what do we do when we don't have experimental evidences? Uh, so for example, uh, we have to bet on horses. Um, how do we bet on horses? It's really difficult because there is, it, the probability of a winning one is not implied by any previous observation. And, um, and there, is, there is no logical way of guessing uh, which horse uh, will win. So from the um, subjective uh, point of view, um, it doesn't matter. So the idea is, okay, I have my opinion, anyone has his own opinion, and this is prior probability. Uh, and doesn't matter how and why you have your opinion. So of course your opinion is based on something, it's based on some information, um, but it can base on whatever kind of information. So the information which is available. Um, so Bayesian um, theory is um, theory which can be used in situation of uncertainty. So when I basically uh, don't know, so based on partial information, um, and this is really successful because basically um, it's assuming that information is always incomplete. Uh, so, the, for example, the, they are criticizing frequency theory, saying that, okay, you think that your probability is objective, but basically it's subjective because you don't have all the information that is needed. So you are, you are basing your guess on partial information because you don't have an infinite series. Uh, so you're, you're just making the same, the prediction is subjective in the sense that, okay, it's based on partial information. So I can bet on horses and it's partial information. So it's basically the same. Uh, so uh, the idea is I can use whatever information I want. Uh, so it's, I don't know, I can believe that uh, the name of the horses is a lucky one, or I can believe that it's my lucky day or whatever. I can observe the horse and say, okay, it's a good one. I can listen to other people telling me what to do. I can, I can really collect wh whatever information. I can ask all the people knowing all the horses and get a really big body of information about uh, the horses. Um, what is important uh, from the subjective point of view is to evaluate how much do I have to believe in my, in my hypothesis. So the idea is that um, I know that the information is incomplete uh, and I should know, I should evaluate how much it is incomplete. So of course, if somebody tells me uh, that um, the horse took some drugs and I believe that the testimony is, um, can be trust, I will, be, um, I will believe that the horse will win to an higher degree. Uh, if I don't have any information, my prediction uh, do not deserve to be believed to a high degree. So the idea is, okay, I, I must evaluate the degree of belief in my hypothesis based on the information that I have. Uh, this does not mean that I cannot have an opinion. I can have an opinion. I just have to know how much I have to trust my opinion. Um, and of course, the idea is that um, what so probability is a measure of the degree of belief in a predictive hypothesis. Um, the degree of belief, since it is subjective, is measured by the decision 
but one is willing to take by relying on the hypothesis. So we will see next, next week uh, the basic um, way of measuring um, probability, subjective probability is a method of a bet. Um, so um, uh, the money, the amount of money that one is willing to put on a bet is the measure of a degree of belief in the hypothesis. So for example, uh, if I strongly, strongly believe that uh, one horse will win, I will put a lot of money on it, if I'm pretty sure. If I do not believe so much in the hypothesis, I will put just a little bit of money. Uh, so the decision are measuring the degree of, of belief. Of course, when I have new information, I can update uh, the degrees of belief. Um, so change uh, the, the idea, uh, my, my previous, my prior beliefs, and I have a posterior beliefs. And usually this is based on what is called, um, it's a method of conditionalization and it's based on um, further observation um, which are considered as pertinent in order to modify the degree of belief. Um, so uh, for example, this is another kind of example just to show you that there are many different ways of applying this. Uh, my computer does not switch on. I have two hypotheses. Uh, battery is dead uh, or uh, it's broken. Okay, so I have two hypotheses and um, I can say, okay, I believe one or the other more. Uh, what to do, the decision to do is to try to um, plug the computer. So the idea is I, I, I try to get more information since I don't know if it's broken or if it's just um, charges over. So the idea is, okay, I, I need more information. Uh, I plug the computer and I know that this information, so if I plug the computer and then it starts, this will rise the probability that the computer does not have any charge to almost certainty. And the probability of a hypothesis that is broken will go down. Um, so uh, the information that I get by plugging the computer is conditioning the prior probability of a two hypothesis that my computer is just uh, not charged or that my computer is broken. Um, and this is measured by the, the decisions. So for example, here, um, if I believed that my computer was broken so strongly, I wouldn't even try to plug it because it, for me, it would be a useless decision because my belief was, okay, it's broken. So I don't even try to plug it. But it's because I was believing a little bit one or and, and the other that I tried. So my decision is revealing my belief, is revealing my degrees of belief. And so we will see that this is really important in, in economics, for example, uh, because decisions um, reveals belief and uh, um, actions and decisions are based on, uh, on beliefs. Uh, so it's a theory of action and it's a theory, um, it's a theory of decision uh, where uh, what is true is what works. The idea is that I, I always have a goal, a preference, and I have to take the decision uh, which is suitable to get my preferred uh, good, my preferred situation, given the probability of uh, future states of the world. So one, uh, one example uh, is in uh, uh, Leonard Savage. Um, so it's, it's really clear to understand why it's so connected to decision theory. Um, so imagine that um, you don't know if tomorrow it will rain. 
um, of course, there are so two possible states of the world, uh, the state of the world where it rains and the state of the world where it doesn't rain. So we have two possible states of the world. This is really simplified. And um, I have to take a decision, which is, do I take an umbrella or not? So if I take the umbrella and it's a sunny day, it's not really good because it's kind of, okay, I have an umbrella, it's a sunny day. It's annoying. Uh, but if I don't have the umbrella and it's rain, I'm in a really bad situation. Um, so the idea is to take, to make the decision uh, which is the best with respect to the probability of the future state of the world. Um, so in, in this case, it depends, of course, on the on the degree of belief in the hypothesis of um, of rain. And of course, I can collect a lot of information. For example, I can um, look to different forecasts. So you know that you have different forecasts for uh, the weather. And then you have to see which one is more reliable. So you have to collect information about which forecast is more reliable than the other. Uh, and so you will make your decision based on the forecast, which is more reliable for you. So for example, you watch one forecast, the weather forecast, and you saying, okay, tomorrow there is the 30% probability of rain. You watch another weather forecast and the other weather forecast you say, okay, tomorrow there is 80% probability of rain. Uh, depending on which one you believe, you will make your decision. Um, and of course, there are no constraints about the information that you can collect in order to rise your degree of belief in the hypothesis. So in, in the case of the weather forecast, you can go back and look at all the history of the channel of the person who is making the forecast. You can do whatever you want, or you can just flip a coin and say, okay, doesn't matter, I will believe by chance. Um, it's dependent on time because of course, to make all this research in the information is costly because you takes time to verify which forecast is reliable or not. You can call a friend, for example, and ask him which one you think is uh, reliable. Um, there are no, no constraints, um, but of course, um, decisions are rational and they are rational because the aim is to maximize utility. Um, so one is not just believing things by chance, uh, because the goal is to get something in the future, is to make the best decision in order to um, have a legitimate expect expectation of getting something in the future. Um, so, um yeah what else um to uh, yes um so we will see all this more in details in, in the next uh, um next days by reading uh different authors and text uh, text and whatever um i would like to sh show a little bit why this is important for the problem of induction it is important for the problem of induction because it provides a pragmatic uh, approach. Um, so, of course, we don't know, um, we cannot have inductive certainty. Uh, and uh, so the logical uh, solution was to measure the ignorance to quantify ignorance in, in a certain way, probability is measuring the confirmation of a theory. Um, from the Bayesian standpoint, um, what we measure is the success of a strategy. So for example, uh, my belief in um, Newtonian laws allows for 
certain kind of decisions, which are good. So if I believe that the world is Newtonian, I can take some decisions which are successful because I have some good predictions. But of course, if I try to reach uh, Jupiter with my shuttle, believing in Newtonian physics, I, I wouldn't get there. I need a relativity theory. So um, the idea is that it, a theory is verified, is, is believed uh, based on the strategies um, or the decision that it allows for. So I have a problem. My problem is to go to Jupiter with my shuttle. In order to solve this problem, I believe in relativity theory and it works. So I have good chances to get there. Um, even though this is not supposing the existence of real probabilities, and it's not based on logical constraints. So there are no logical constraints telling me you have to believe in relativity theory. Uh, it's just a uh, habit, uh, inferential habit. So uh, theory are selected um, through time as good way of, uh, as a good strategies to get uh, something. So for example, the, the belief that the, a uh, planet is a sphere, is something that we consider as certain, but basically according to this uh, theory of probability, it's just an hypothesis, but everybody behave like they believe that the planet is a sphere, so they make certain decision because they believe that it's a sphere. In the past, for example, they thought that the uh, Earth was flat. So for example, they didn't navigate after uh, Spain. They didn't go to the ocean because they thought that it, it was over, no? So the belief uh, imply the decisions. So if I believe something, this entails some uh, possible decisions. Uh, and a theory is good uh, if the decision that I take by relying on the prediction are successful, are efficient. So this is a pragmatic way of considering the truth of, uh, of a theory. Uh, so it's not about the conformity with a metaphysical reality. It's not the conformity with some logical necessity. So my belief is not constrained, constrained by logical necessity, um, but it's better to believe things that allows me to make successful decisions. Uh, so the development, the evolution of knowledge is the evolution of practices in some way, practices which are based on uh, hypotheses or predictions uh, which are useful. Um, so we will never get certainty about reality, but we, we gain reasons to believe in hypotheses and these reasons to believe in hypotheses uh, are uh, the strategies, the efficient strategies that this hypothesis uh, allow for. Uh, so it's a pragmatic way of uh, considering uh, truth. Um, of course, we need some um, other axioms, of course, to see that is rational. So for example, coherence. Coherence is very important in the sense that um, if an agent is not current, uh, his decision won't be successful. Coherence means that, for example, I cannot believe uh, in prediction which depends on uh, relativity theory for some things and believe in hypotheses which depends on, for example, Aristotelian um, metaphysics for other decisions. So I cannot believe uh, things which are contradictory. I cannot believe at the same time that the planet is flat uh, and that um, Newton was right or whatever. I cannot have contradicting beliefs. So if I'm coherent, everything is fine. Uh, if my beliefs are not coherent, 
there are problems. So this is uh, called the uh, Dutch book argument. So according to this Dutch book argument, uh, if the belief, the all the belief of a person are coherent, no bookmaker can be sure to win by proposing any kind of set of bets. If the belief of a person are not coherent, so if there are contradiction, a bookmaker can be sure to win. Um, um, Anna? Yes. I, I have a short question about the um, coherency part and um, um, maybe coming from my own practice in, in sociology, um, there's a lot of like the, uh, what kind of theories are chosen to explain certain phenomena. It's very, like, it's, it's very con, like, if, if we would like uh, look actually and that all these theories that are chosen, okay, in that area, this theory is chosen in that area, this theory is chosen and, but they are actually contradictory, but it's basically, okay, depending on like field or on scale. And the question is, um, um, like at least at first sight, you would say, okay, but they are contradictory. You can't believe them at the same time. You, there is no unifying account of that. Um, how does one, like how, how does one deal with this? Could there also like could there be um, a way to say, yeah, okay, there is a certain justification to use different theories in the different fields if these scale dependence, for example, is explained by a larger unifying theory, or um, how would one deal with that? Yeah, so um, that's one of the problem in, in Bayesianism, in a sense that it's not possible to define coherence. So they tried, <laughs> but it's no way. Um, the idea is that, so we, we have two, um, two, two things, I think. So one thing is that uh, from the subjective point of view, any kind of set of belief is justified in the sense that um, I don't believe in science. Uh, I am a society, pre-scientific society. And my beliefs are based on the idea that there are gods which are hungry and so they make things happen. That's okay. So one person believing currently in that kind of world will make reasonable decision in Bayesian terms. Of course, is able to take to make some decision and not other decisions. Uh, so some um, utility won't be able to satisfy some specific utilities by believing in a certain world because it won't be able to make some kind of decisions. Uh, in the same way as we don't make uh, decisions like uh, I make a dance in order to make it rain tomorrow. Um, but from the um, subjective point of view, there is no, no problem. Um, so this allows for different systems of beliefs that must be current. Um, on the other hand, um, in uh, when you have one science with different hypotheses, uh, the idea is that um, Bayesian way of thinking of this plurality of hypotheses is the best one, because basically uh, you can compare the probability of different hypotheses. Um, so uh, the point is that given a data set or given information, um, basically a plurality of hypotheses uh, are legitimate based on the information which is available because there are no logical constraints. If we are in logical probability, you have some evidence and we are obliged to believe something. But since there are no logical constraints, given some information, like a data set, whatever, you can have 10 different predictive hypotheses, which is what, what we observe. Um, optimistic Bayesians says, that's good because we have different hypotheses and then we can update. Uh, so um, we, we make new observation and we modify the degrees of belief that these different hypotheses deserve. Um, and we, we converge. So one of the most interesting things 
in Bayesian is, is this uh, convergence uh, theorem, which is fascinating. So the idea is that uh, two agents or more who are starting with completely different beliefs about the same event. So we are calculating the probability of rain tomorrow, for example. And we are starting with completely different beliefs, a completely different hypothesis, because we are considering different kinds of information. Um, the theorem says that if we share our information, so I know the hypothesis that you are evaluating, you know the hypothesis that I am evaluating, and I know the evidence that supports your idea, and you know the hypothesis, the information which supports mine, and we make the same following observation. By updating, thanks to bias formula, we will agree automatically. <laughs> So this is the magic of Bayesianism, and this is the reason why it's considered as the solution to the human problem. Uh, because even though you start your prior belief are totally different, um, if you share all the information and you make all the following uh, observation in common, using the same formula, the two agents starting with different belief will converge. This is the ground, for example, for equilibrium theory in, in, in the market. Um, so, um, this is mathematical, so it, it works or, or it doesn't. So, there are, there are conditions for this to, to work. Um, so, example can be um we are um different ideas about the weather tomorrow we have because we have different information and different expectations but uh, if you observe for example the sky together uh before the rain or the sun we will agree of course or um by making new observation, um, or also about um, experimental things. So the more evidence I have, if we share the observation and we update the probability of different hypotheses. So we have to evaluate always a plurality of different hypotheses. If you are evaluating these hypotheses, um, and the new information by applying the formula, we are we agree. So the idea is that objectivity can be reached even though we start from subjective uh, probabilities. So this is the magic of Bayesianism: is that even though we start with any kind of opinion based on whatever, we will converge to objectivity. We will believe. We will have the same degree of belief in the different hypotheses by sharing information and making the same observation together by sharing information and updating, of course, uh, conditioning on the information which is considered as pertinent. So we can reach objectivity, objectivity not as this is conformed to a supposed reality, but objectivity like uh, intersubjective agreement. So, um, and this is the, for example, the reason why this is so uh, appealing for science, because even though we can have different hypotheses based on also the same information, the same data set, for example, um, there is this theorem which says that um, degrees of belief uh, tends tend to converge. Of course, degrees of belief. So we will never get certainty, uh, but we, the tendency is to converge toward a degree, a certain degree of belief or the degree of belief in different hypotheses. Uh, no hypothesis is ever ruled out. No hypothesis is ever absolutely certain. It's, it's an ongoing evaluation in the sense that um, it's possible to observe something new which make uh, which makes my my degrees of belief to change or my opinion to change. So it's not 
is, is never certain, but there is this, there are this convergence phenomenon uh, of opinion based on information. Um, so this is, for example, why that is so used in, in economics, uh, because it's supposed, for example, uh, you have the um, classic theory, uh, and in classic theory, uh, you know, you have to observe prices. So all the information is conveyed by prices. Uh, all the agents are observing the same prices. So they will converge with respect to the belief. So anybody will behave in a conform conformly to, to the belief. And the equilibrium is rich because any, anybody is correctly expecting what anybody else will do because they are conditioning their belief on the same information, which is information provided by prices. Um, so ideally, this works. Um, practically, no. <laughs> or um, there are some, this is the big problem. So the problem is that since it's based on sharing information, um, if information is public and free, convergence can be reached. But if information is costly and rare, you have some agents who have some information, others who are hiding their own information, other one investing in private research for information, and you will never get to the convergence of belief. And of course, since you know, anybody knows that uh, rational agents are conditioning by probability on information, uh, you can manipulate the belief by manipulating the information. So if you want somebody to believe something, you have to provide him with some kind of information. So he will believe something uh, and you can hide other information. Uh, so this is this is the old problem. So um, it it became a problem of so it, it's the same also in science um, in the sense that in the ideal situation where scientists are really collaborating uh, in order to um, share all the possible information and to find the theory which is ac actually more reliable, uh, it works. Uh, it doesn't work, of course, it's, there is a competition between uh, research laboratories. One is trying to support um, a commercial operation and one is trying to support another one. So one will find proof or evidences supporting one hypothesis and the other one will find proof or evidences to support another one. And, um, and then it's really difficult to choose uh, what to believe. Uh, and that's why at the beginning I, I said that um, gambling is still in the air in the sense that choose to believe a theory is like uh, choosing the lottery uh, to engage with. Um, and, um, and of course, this is, this is the problem. So on the one hand, it provides a lot of advantages um because it allows to calculate the probability of any kind of event any kind of discipline um it's good for decision theory uh so it's practically useful on the other hand um it's difficult to find what's what's the truth uh, because sometimes belief converge, not because they are the best, but they converge because there is a manipulation based on what information is released. Um, so this is, this is a little bit the, the, the general problem. And um, towards about the idea of uh, um, Science of knowledge, uh, the idea of science of knowledge is that uh, usually, you know, uh, science has this problem that it cannot predict its own development. 
So the theory change and science is cannot be science of science, but Bayesian is not allowed to make a science of science in the sense that is not um, a theory about uh, what will happen, but what we have to believe about what will happen. So it's about the development of scientific knowledge. So it's all about how our belief change. So this is really important because usually you need a philosophy in order to criticize science uh, or scientific prediction. In Bayesian is no, because the critique is implied in the methodology. So it's a process of learning. Um, so it's it's um, basically an, an idea on the development of the evolution of knowledge. And so this is this is why it's so um, successful, and this is why it's so important for induction. So it's important for induction because you reach this um, convergence of beliefs, practically good strategies, we can say. Uh, so you, you get objectivity even though you start from subjectivities, and this means that you don't have to suppose any metaphysical reason, um, any the existence of something like uh, real random variables. Um, there is no logical constraint, so it's really free from any um, kind of philosophical principle. And magically, you get this convergence of beliefs, so objectivity. Um, Anna? Yes. One, one other question. Uh, what you said about that um, Bayesianism is like an idea of, a, of the evolution of knowledge. Um, and I think earlier you said that there were like, um, a no if I understood that right, I don't know. Um, is it like a normative assessment of, okay, how should we behave in order to believe the most rational thing? Or is like a descriptive, okay, this is actually how does knowledge evolve? How do people actually pick their, um, uh, pick their decision, make their decisions and pick their beliefs and so on? Or are there like two, two versions, like one normative, one descriptive? And yeah. Yeah, so there are different Bayesianism, uh, kind of thousand of different approaches. Um, so there is, uh, for example, an, an idea is that Bayesianism is really natural. So for example, uh, uh, natural selection is a way of selecting the more probable predictive hypotheses. Uh, so in, in, in the idea of the Bayesian brain, for example, uh, the priors are encoded in the ADN. Um, like uh, the most probable hypothesis, predictive hypothesis. Uh, so uh, you have, for example, species believing, believing like as if they were believing that given some sensation, some observation, some, some information from the environment, uh, another information will come next. So for example, hearing, uh, a certain noise in the forest make more probable the uh, coming of a predator. So if hypothesis is a predictive hypothesis, which is encoded in the genes, uh, if the population with, with predictive hypothesis is right, so this is efficient, they will reproduce. If a hypothesis is not correct, uh, they will die. So more adapted predictive hypothesis spread and less adapted predictive hypothesis disappears. Um, so this is the natural way of seeing this. So our um, science or our hypotheses are, are the same in the sense that uh, the most successful hypotheses uh, spread and everybody adopts them because they are useful and the less adapt um, hypotheses disappear, adapt to, to the environment. Um, um, the other way to, um, to think about it is that um, the calculation is not possible. Uh, so it, it's, said to be, it's said to be normative, um, not because it's imposing some truth, 
because it does not. Um, what is in what is imposing um, or presupposing is um, computational capacity. Um, so uh, to to be able to calculate, uh, we will see this with with the um, algorithmic probability more specifically. Anyway, uh, we said that given us a data set or information, you can extract a lot of different hypotheses, many different hypotheses. Um, so uh, if you have kind of 1,000 different hypotheses and you try to conditioning the probability of 1,000 different hypotheses, you will never calculate this. So it's undoable, even by computers. Um, so uh, the idea is, in order to be able to carry the rational calculation, I need to evaluate a small number of alternative hypotheses. And usually the small number of uh, hypotheses is what is called common knowledge. So if we are sharing the same common knowledge, we will agree, which means, for example, that if you are considering if uh, tomorrow will be rainy or sunny, uh, we have just two options, or so rain or sun, and it's easy um, to agree, but we had to agree previously that there are only two possible states of the world which are possible. And um, we have, for example, to believe both of us that some information is pertinent in order to condition the probability of this. Um, so if we share all this previous knowledge, which is common knowledge, because we, we have some previous prior belief which is shared, so we will agree. Um, the problem is that this common knowledge uh, is not always justified in the sense that um, uh, the norm is the presupposition of common knowledge, which is not always satisfied. So it's important because on one side you have this evolution of knowledge, but this evolution of knowledge is always supposed also supposed to produce common knowledge. Um, so you, your next prediction are based on the common knowledge that evolved, that have been selected. The problem is that um, since it's just practical utility, there is no reason. Um, to believe so mm, yeah i don't know if it's answered the the question i don't know a little bit but i don't know myself as if i'm that true but i mean i guess we go we're gonna go that in in the course over the course uh but yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for the it's before, like uh, in this general okay how to make basically rational decisions like as like this universal theory of that yeah sounds sounds very exciting yeah no no it, it's fascinating then uh, it depends if it works or not so there are situations in which it works so if you if you don't have many processes to consider it works and if you agree about what information is pertinent it works uh but you need these these conditions and they're not always there basically Anna, there were some questions also on the chat. Yeah. Uh, some people trying to develop some questions concerning objectivity, objective probability. Yeah, so about Popper, I, I didn't talk about Popper, but uh, basically um, logic um, attitude, so Carnap attitude is against uh, Popper. So Popper says, okay, theory are, can be falsified. Um, um, the problem is that it's really difficult to falsify uh, um, 
a theories of the, the ideas that we can confirm um, a theory, so we can increase or decrease the degree of belief, but there is no um, basically way to disconfirm or to falsify um, a theory. And of course, there is the, the idea of a, of a propensity theory, which is another one, um, which is more objective than, than subjective. Uh, so it's so popular. So there are the people who are suggesting that there are some connection between Popper and, and Bayesianism. Uh, the problem is that uh, Popper is uh, using deductive arguments and not inductive arguments. Um, so the idea is that, okay, I have my, my theory, but I construct starting from deductive logic, so from principle, and then um empirical evidence can falsify uh the the theory but it's not an inductive reasoning it's more deductive uh, so it's there is a use of probability with probabilities which is um connected with this deductive logic and then the, the other problem with popper was that is excluded the possibility is excluded the rare events. So um, this is part of a, of a debate. So uh, the problem is uh, when I have frequencies or I have propensities, I cannot predict rare events. So events for which I have but never happened before. Um, and the problem usually is to try to to make the forecasts of things that I never observed, uh, or um, of things for which there is no uh, frequency, no uh, experiment. So I can be interested in predicting the next earthquake, for example. But I don't have enough past frequencies in order to make the prediction of next earthquake. earthquake. So it cannot be uh, scientifically predicted, but it can be predict this. So to predict this, I need um, another kind of view on probabilities, which is not the propensity for earthquakes, but it's more the propensity to believe that an, an earthquake is likely to happen. Um, anyway, well, there are relations between uh, Popper and uh, Bayesian theory. I think I, I read kind of few papers about this. I can I can send uh, the paper if you are interested in this relation between uh, Popper probability theories, Carnap, because Pop Carnap made all his theory against, and uh, um, relations between Popper and uh, Bayesianism. You have other questions? I had a question actually. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was curious uh, whether um, you know of any like uh, Bayesian sort of uh, response to like the frame problem in AI. So like the capacity for reframing, like, I mean, I can sort of imagine there might be one, but I, I'm, I'm trying to like figure out how it would work. And yeah, basically wondering if you had any idea or um like like yeah basically if, if there's if there is one um kind of standard explanation for how how uh, that kind of selectivity happens yeah so usually um in um in artificial intelligence um algorithms learn because they are fed by that data so you provide examples and this is limiting the, the, the kind of information. So if you want um, an algorithm to recognize an image, you give a lot of examples of the same image. And then its prior probability, of course, depends uh, on 
the set that you provide. So this, this, is, this is the problem in the sense that the data that you provide, the algorithm uh, determine the prior probabilities of the algorithm. So the hypothesis is what it, it will make. Um, and this is, this is really difficult uh, in the sense that um, on the one hand, you have kind of prejudice which are going to the algorithm because they are examining uh, certain cases. So for example, there was this big problem, uh, the algorithm thinking that, for example, black people are more likely to be criminal than white people because they were statistically um, considering uh, past cases or information. And so that, this was the, the conclusion. Um, so um, the problem with Bayesian reasoning in, in general is that it's not possible to eliminate this kind of prejudice because we have prior um, hypotheses which are in a certain way culturally given or genetically encoded if you are if you are in the natural naturalistic perspective um, and um, the prior opinion since it is subjective it's not constrained uh, by nothing so these prior probabilities usually express more a prejudice or a really a superficial opinion than reality then the the idea is that um, it's, it's a process. Um, so learning can change the prior probability. So all, all, the, all the thing is that, okay, we start from very bad opinions, which are really far from reality, really far from truth or usefulness or whatever. And uh, it's a learning process. So the idea is that it's basically the learning process which can um, teach uh, what is the hypothesis to, to trust. Um, but of course, um, so there are different methods in, in artificial intelligence. For example, uh, there are this method of randomization when you have a method of randomization, rather than giving a data set which has some order or which is uh, already worked in some way, which responds to some previous opinion, even if it's unconscious or whatever, we just try to eliminate any order, any possible order and provide data which are uh, with the um, um, highest um, entropy. So it's called max end. It's one of the of the of the theory max end, which is also used in um, quantum mechanics. Is to say, okay, um, in order to avoid to take our prejudice or our subjective opinion into the process, uh, we try to um, use the data with less possible information, so with more entropy. Um, these are different methods. So there are many different Bayesianisms. So it's not a unified, so it's a unified uh, theory, uh, but you have many, many different ways of applying this. And uh, basically you have different positions ranging from very subjective positions, uh, like definitely we will see next week. It's the most subjective possible. And then you have other positions which are closely, cl very close to logical positions. Um, so you have all the degrees from very, very subjective where it doesn't care. So you can start from whatever belief and we get right. And other positions which are really, really strict about the creation of prior probabilities, because this is the problem. How do I uh, create uh, good priors? And, um, and it's a big debate and it, then it depends also on, on the problem on, but re, this, yeah, this is a problem, <laughs> of course.
Yes, if anyone has some questions, so maybe we could go around to get to know each other. Yes, exactly. So, because I would like to, yes, to know what are your interests, what you do, who you are, uh, because I was thinking that um, for the presentations, you could, you could bring something you are interested in, so to add something to the, to the bibliography. So if you are developing, you are studying research on a specific field or application of Bayesianism, uh, you can uh, share uh, a reading and introduce the reading and talk about it. Um, so just to know your proposals, if you, if you, if you agree to do this, uh, if, you, if you don't, you, you can also take one of the reading in the, in the syllabus and just to introduce one of the read one of the reading and then discuss this. Um, but if you if you like, you are invited to add something to the bibliography. So to choose a reading that you would like to share and introduce and talk about it, which is related with uh, our topic. Um, so um, I think that we can decide this next week. So you think this this week, uh, next week. Um, you propose your uh, reading, your, your topic for, for the presentation, and uh, uh, we will try to set uh, the date. And uh, so you will make your presentation, and then we will need a respondent for any, any presentation. So we'll share a document where you could, can sign in for. Um, okay, so uh, maybe let's maybe you with uh, spreadsheets so people can choose the dates and the reading, the corresponding reading from the session. Yes, exactly. So I have I shared a document which is um, I have here. Uh, Usually, um, students um, present right a text. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're thinking of an essay, essay also. Uh, if it if it depends on the research, uh, the stage of research of each one. If it, yeah. <clears throat> usually, there, there there are some is is interesting also to experiment uh, with essays I guess. I'm trying to share my, but it's kind of charging. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm sharing this document, which is called presentation. You can find it in the same folder and you can pick a date uh, starting from 20th. Um, one, I can't see your screen. Can anybody else see Anna's screen? No. We only see that you there's the students and a started screen sharing, but not your screen itself. It's just black. <laughs> well, it's maybe, maybe, maybe you chose the wrong window to share. I don't know. Like, like this. Because it was thinking a lot, my computer. Still thinking a lot. If you, if you could try again to take it off and thank you. There's quite a lot of lag on the, uh, I think Anna, your picture is stopped. In fact, you might have stopped <laughs> completely. Uh, 
because she left. She's trying to get back here. I'm sorry, my computer doesn't want to share the document. <laughs> he refused. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK, now. I cannot hear you. Can you hear us now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, it's not it's not a big deal. It's just a document which is shared with a date. Uh, any date where is the topic, and you will just put your name under the date that you like, that you would like. And then we try to have equal number of people for any date. Uh, and uh, and respondents, so it's, it's really easy. But we will decide this uh, next week. So you can make your proposal starting from this week, just to put your name on a date with a topic you would like to, to talk about. Uh, and we finalize this process next week and we will start uh, the following with the presentations until the end. So how, do we, we, how, how should we communicate um, which uh, text we want to choose? Uh, you write. <laughs> Per mail, simply, or uh, no? It varies this shared document on Google. Ah, okay, okay. So we ah, so that was uh, a link yeah. and a mail. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I put I put a new one in the folder in the in the drive, uh, the one that my computer doesn't want to show you now, uh, and um, you just put your name and the um, reading you would like to to discuss uh, on the on the document. Uh, and next week we will decide all this so you can just propose and then we will see next week to finalize the what should anyway, the I, will you, I will send you an email more precise about this and because we just have half an hour to, to present for the, to introduce yourself so I'm looking forward to Yeah, so I will call uh, each one of you to present yourselves in, in, uh, in an order. Uh, there is Eric here, uh, the first, maybe. It's really difficult to hear what you're saying. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, my setup is not uh, good. Uh, I will try to fix this. Fix this. But uh, maybe Eric can start the round. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Eric. Um, I live in Germany. I'm still doing my uh, bachelor's, but I'm in the. F oh, there is now feedback. Okay, feedback is gone. Good. <laughs> um, and now I'm in my final phase. Um, for like the last half year, I pretty much dropped out of all academic activities so far because of like COVID hit in a void pretty much. And I'm trying to come back a little bit and uh, I study sociology and philosophy, but have been really frustrated with this recently and have orientated myself much more to um, political pragmatic strategizing. Uh, so, so I'm especially interested in this, okay, like trying to find a, this could be a mediator as like, okay, trying to find strategizing, making rational decisions, basically as a universal method for, that you can apply for everything. And um, yeah, let's see how that goes. <laughs> Thank you. So I go in the order in my in my screen. Then I have John. 
Hi, I'm John Soski. I live in Providence, Rhode Island, the United States. I work um, in a clinic with people who are formerly incarcerated. And as part of that, I teach research methodology um, in a medical school. And in um, I've become, through that, become very interested in the way that the qualitative quantitative division is institutionalized in different research spaces. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about how that ties in with things like the replication crisis and um, questions about the crisis, the ability, the crisis that comes from the ability to mechanize science that say goes back to Husserl. Um, so, you know, I'm interested in some questions about Bayesianism and AI, Judea Pearl's critique that um, Bayesianism can't model intelligence because it's incapable of causal inference. Um, but I'm also interested in these sort of larger historical questions about to what extent can scientific reasoning as such be, be mechanized. Thank you. I think that your field is really interesting because I mean, I, it's really wondering about this, this kind of social application in medicine, health, and but that's, I think that's one of the most problematic uh, fields of, of application. So it would be really interesting to, to discuss also about this. Ender? Yeah, uh, my name is Ender. Um, I'm originally from Ireland, but currently living in London. My background is in philosophy and fine art. Uh, I just finished uh, a master's in fine art. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I I just sort of know the really basic information on uh, Bayesian reasoning. So I wanted to take a course and actually go into a bit more in-depth analysis on it. Um, I guess like my my kind of interest in a philosophical sense comes down to yeah questions of like framing and the political implications of framing um and and how that bears on decision you know on on questions of like uh rationality in general and mind so um yeah that's it thank you great we will discuss about this a lot alfredo hi i am alfredo I live in Mexico. I did a bachelor's in applied math, and I currently work as a machine learning engineer mm -hmm. in industry. Um, I'm interested in um, working or doing a PhD in philosophy of science, uh, especially in the so-called science of science uh, subgenre of it, if you can call it that way. Um, yeah, I've studied a bit of Bayesian reasoning um, from the perspective of Bayesian statistics, but I'm truly interested in this seminar to, to grasp a more epistemological um, yeah, critique on the creation of knowledge and on the, yes, the creation of knowledge, that's it, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think that your knowledge of the math will be useful. <laughs> and also the technical, because I mean, I, it, it's a little bit my, my limit to go in the math in the real technicalities of the thing, so. Good. Hi, Daryl. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, my background, uh, I guess I have uh, interest um, in the philosophy of math. Um, I have come from a background of doing a lot of practical IT, um, not really getting into the machine learning, but um, also from taking um, Daniel Sacolato's course uh, last term, uh, got quite interested in the uh, brain modeling of predictive processing. So I think uh, the Bayesian approach to understanding the brain as opposed to a naturalist approach, I think is a really interesting dynamic. Um, and yeah, I've had some courses with Anna before and found them very helpful. Thank you, 
Thank you. So yes, we will deal a little bit with the brain, but I think that you could help us <laughs> bring in something that you know. Um, yes, I think I'm, I'm just looking at the seminar in a kind of participative way. So trying to uh, collect ideas and knowledges from everybody and really try to, to discuss what is interesting for, for us. So really asking questions and, and try to go deeper in the things, in the topics you are more interested in and also share your uh, knowledges and because maybe somebody has a question which cannot be answered by me, but can be answered by somebody else who has more expertise in this domain. So that, that, that's great. So let's be open to, to interact. And I think we will have a lot to learn. Uh, Paulina? Hi, uh, I come from the background of comparative literature. And then I moved to, into more fine art uh, kind of fields in new media and technologies. and. I'm, I'm interested in a very broad sense uh, or in the idea of the absolute knowledge and the limits of the absolute knowledge. And yeah, that's why I'm here, <laughs> just to listen and to explore ideas. Great, thank you. Amy? Hiya. Oh, yeah. um, I'm an artist and teach uh, fine art and run a project space and um, reading room. And my work has sort of been navigating this territory, should we say, <laughs> for about a decade of um, applying um, high frequency trading algorithms to news production and um, trying to sort of think through problems with the derivative mm. and most recently sort of focusing on insurance in terms of an ecological sort of um, um, understanding of <laughs> I'm caught I'm caught in this <laughs> I'm in the fascination of 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 the theory but I'm also caught in its um its its um, problem in that this this sort of um, the anticipation of the the unforeseen is actually a massive problem. Mm -hmm. So basically, the the sort of summary that you've just given of all of the problems that come of this, whether or not it be bias and discrimination in in a in a sort of sense of this amplifying and reproducing that, or in terms of say insurance, how does one then deal with the real problem of of you know, the unprecedented is not unprecedented. We know that anyway. The natural is not a natural disaster necessarily either, but I'm really sort of caught in that, um, in the glare of those headlights still <laughs> just going, how does this, where, where does this, how do we move on from this basically? How is it possible to move beyond that? Because this is the, the, the problem, I think, at the current time. So I'm sort of hoping that through conversation <laughs> I can help with you all that we'll solve it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, that's my problem too. I mean, I, I've been uh, interested in, in this topic. So I, I just finished writing a, a book about, about this, but the, the goal is basically the, the same. How do we get out from, <laughs> from, from this? So, yeah, so I see. And yeah, I hope we have nice discussions in order to go deeper and try to find a solution. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I can pronounce Zaihar, Zihar. Sorry. Hi. Uh, it's Zihar, actually. Uh, okay. Fine. Like everybody is uh, kind of suffers with pronouncing my name. It's totally fine. Uh, I come from a physics background uh, in my bachelor's. I'm currently doing um, master's studies in the field of philosophy of science. Uh, I'm currently uh, in Germany and um, 
I'm kind of interested, like the reason that I want to get into this course is to get a um, general in-depth overview of all uh, Bayesian reasoning and also like how much uh, uh, it is involved within uh, the sciences uh, in general, especially like in from the background where I come from, like physics. So, yeah. That's great. We have also physics. That's wonderful. We have all the different expertise. I'm very happy about it. Thank you. Then I have Vincent. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Vincent. I'm a writer and researcher based in Manila. My current inquiry and practice circuits on poetics, theory, um, materialism, but also philosophy of science and nature. Um, I'm particularly interested in, um, or generally interested in reasoning, epistemology, and algorithmic mediation. That's why I took this course. Okay, thank you. So, Alan? Uh, hi, me, Alan. Yes. Ah, hi. Okay. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm uh, from Mexico City. I have a background in architecture and a bit of critical theory and media theory. And I'm currently um, hoping to start a, a PhD, uh, which is uh, which my plan is to write it write about uh, the relationship between. Oh, sorry, this is just like a trumpet outside, so. May we can pass to someone else? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, but don't worry. Huh? But it's a lot of noise, no? No? Let me close the window. Sorry. It's Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> I'm trying to do a project around the relationship between algorithmic prediction and contingency, but my grasp on, on uh, probability theory is quite uh, weak, so that's what I want to like, uh, develop in this course. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Nikita? Yeah, hello there. Um, sorry I don't have my video today. I'm not feeling quite good. I know I'm based in Moscow and I uh, work at Garage Museum of Contemporary Art. I'm research curator for a program that supports artists and researchers who deal with emerging technologies. And a lot of the artists I work with uh, work uh, with the problematics of uh, different kinds of uh, algorithmic modes of knowledge production, um, artificial intelligence. So I'm quite interested in the history of Bayesian reasoning as uh, uh, something that's foundational for a lot of uh, these kinds of technologies. And uh, I've also had my master degree in economics a while ago. Uh, so I have some basic idea of Bayesian methodology from like theory of probability causes. Um, so I did have some flashbacks to that time today. Um, quite interested in what's coming up. Okay, thank you. Great. So we will try to discuss also the relation with the arts because I think it's interesting to see what the role of the arts can be with respect to all this way of reasoning. That's yeah. Uh, Arman. Yeah, hi. hi. Uh, sorry for not having a video as well because I have a pen that is not very good. Uh, but anyway, uh, my background is in literature too. I live in Iran. Um, I haven't much uh, academic background, um, and the reason for my interest is really a general interest. I know I want to understand what's what about Bayesian reason. So yeah, that's basically that. Happy to be here. Okay, thank you. And then Dilshat, sorry for the pronunciation. Yeah, it's Dilshat, yeah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. I live in Iraq. Uh, I have studied a bit of biostatistics in medical school. 
So, uh, you know, I, I think the reason for my uh, joining in this uh, seminar is that, you know, I think doctors like everybody else are, we are quite non-Bayesians when it comes to rational decision-making capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of research that suggests, you know, doctors usually neglect, for example, certain evidence which is related to, for example, history taking and physical examination in favor of, in favor of, for example, diagnostic testing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Daniel Kahneman, you know, the famous psychologist says that, you know, doctors are the most non-Bayesians that you could find. So I'm hoping to, to, develop, uh, uh, to develop an understanding that helps me to make more rational decision uh, judgments when it comes to clinical diagnosis, for example. Yeah, or maybe less rational decisions. Also. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> No, in the sense that, but I think I think it's it's a problem how much one has to, to rely on the um, automatic prediction and how much one does not have to rely on it. So I think it's it's a bit of dilemma. I, I don't know, but I think I think it's a, it's a question, no? Also in this kind of pandemic time. Where, and any political decision is based on this kind of curves, on these statistics, and it's really difficult to to see what what is more believable uh, among the different predictions. Anyway, I'm I'm really happy to to have you in my seminars. I so wondering to have different, so different backgrounds, different interests, different expertise. And um, I think that we will have rich discussion and exchanges. And I'm really looking forward for it. So uh, please, you are really invited to contribute by proposing uh, something, a reading, uh, coming from your, your field uh, to bring uh, to the class a little bit of your knowledge, also your questioning, your problems and uh, uh, things you really want to discuss. So the idea is not, okay, I just propose something because I want to make a lesson, but also in, in the idea, okay, this is the most problematic for me. Uh, so let, let's take this this reading or this text, this image can be can be whatever this problem, and let's try to to see why it's problematic. What and and try to generate a discussion and thinking about it and try to um, really uh, take advantage of the presence of all the others. Um, so I think it would be would be great. Um, so I will. So I put this this document in the in the Google Drive. I will send it also by email. Um, the idea is okay. You will see. I, I don't try again to share because I will be disconnected by my computer. Um, I will. So you have the dates. Um, and with the topic and the readings which are in that day, uh, you just add your name under the topic which is closer to your interest and the uh, title of a suggesting reading problem, what you want to, to discuss that day. Um, and uh, for any uh, presentation, uh, I think we need a, uh, somebody to discuss um so just sign up also uh for um responding to the topic you are more interested in uh for the uh discussion proposals that you think are more you feel more comfortable to to discuss to um, and uh, okay, so you can just 
start from today and uh, next week we will go through the list and we will see if everything is fine and and we will just confirm uh, the, the list and we will start from uh, not next week the other one I don't remember the number um, anyway we have the third uh, class and we will start with a presentation starting from the third class uh, so you will have half of your grade uh, coming from <laughs> this presentation uh, and the other half will be from a final essay so if you are interested in uh, getting some uh, evaluation uh, there will be this final essay that can be uh, maybe also part of your personal research uh, in the sense that I am not really asking for uh, a final essay like a real essay to be published with I, I'm also uh, interested in ideas which are developing. So, and this is also an occasion to, for you to have a feedback in some way about things you are elaborating, you are working on and ideas. So, but we will have time for the final essay because it will be, I think you will have to submit it two weeks after the end of the seminar. Um, okay, so you have any any question, remark? Um, can I ask, um, how long is the presentation for? Ah, uh, yeah, uh, usually it's 10 minutes, uh, which is not a lot, uh, with uh, five minutes for the um, uh, discussion. Okay. Uh, but of course, we can make it a little bit longer. Is it possible to do? Um, I've been having a <laughs> we're having a hilarious time um, trying to <laughs> trying to show people different forms of um, media works uh, mm -hmm. in an online context, which can turn into a full you know farce. Um, and so I've been editing um, it into a pre-recorded talk video sort mm -hmm. of format. Is it possible to do that? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, no, I think I think that we if we have some variety of things would be better to Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Um and now what you said about uh, about the final essay that it can be part of our own research. So do you mean like uh, that basically um we try to uh, we try to apply Bayesian reasoning to our own area of research, or try to ask how can it help there, or something like that. Roughly? Yeah, for example, I don't know. Um, uh, can be that your inquiry, for example, in social sciences is I don't know put into question by some argument from. Definiti, and so you want to write about it, or <laughs> I don't know, or you are just elaborating your thoughts or writing an article, a paper, or whatever, and um, and you think that it's related to. Um, you can just propose it, so mm -hmm. or you can just pretend that you you are. Uh, Bayesian researcher and a pure article of <laughs> no I don't I don't think anybody would believe that <laughs> no but okay that, that 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 sounds quite quite interesting and quite like okay that we can explore that for ourselves and dip our toes into that yeah that's okay Well, I'd like to take the chance also to present myself, I guess, I, I missed. Uh, my name is Rafael, I'm uh, based in Brazil, Brasilia. I will be moderating the session and anything that you need help. Uh, 
I've been around um, by mail, I, I try to assist. I study computer science. Uh, I also have a social science background. Uh, and it's like interesting to, to integrate uh, different uh, fields of thought and beliefs. So really interesting to be following also this seminar. Thank you, Sarafa. You will I'll pass with the um, to remind about presentations as discuss discussions and we're going to send a mail right after that. Uh, I can forward the mail so they can uh, view the spreadsheet. And yes, uh, let's see. I guess there are like one or two uh, presentations, I believe, right? Per, per day. Okay, so you haven't received any syllabus, any materials. It's um, um, it's on the on the Google Drive. Uh, so I, I'm going to to share the link again. Um, so after now after the class, uh, did did you receive the collective emails with information for the links? And okay, so I will answer to that mail with all the address and I will send the link again. And it's a Google Drive link and there is a folder. And in the folder, you have a syllabus with uh, dates and topics and list of readings. And then you have for any uh, class, a little folder with the readings inside. And you can download them, I think. Uh, so, okay, I will send it again just in case. Okay, so if we are good, uh, I can say goodbye and see you next week. If you have any other question, whatever, just write me, uh, me or Rafael and uh, see you next week. Um, I'm looking forward for it. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Hi. Thanks. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,